tell us? Well, they're both um, these the two lakang that we're working on during this, this week. The that. two temples, yeah, the one that we're standing on, and the one across the way, are both uh, called by the local uh, people lotso lakang. That means translate the temple of the translator. And usually here, that's understood to be the translator, the great translator, Rinchen Zangpo, who uh, uh, lived from the end of the 10th to the middle of the 11th century. This used to be a gompa, right? And But now, I mean, like, it used to be a monastery, but now it's no longer one. Yes, and that's partially the reason why it's fallen into disrepair, because the, although the, the uh, local people have... Uh, I have uh, really with great uh, love and attention and done their best to try to keep it in repair. Of course, they're not, he, they don't have the experience and they're not sitting in the monastery every day. So when something, when a leak uh, appears, it may be a couple of weeks until they see it. The temples are still used. There are lamas here and there is a Buddhist society which is elected by the uh, community and which is has its funds it collects its funds from contributions from the community, and they are responsible. But uh, during this century, as far as I know, there has never been an active monastery, and that's part of the reason why the, the general maintenance work that's necessary in every season of this very harsh climate simply wasn't, hasn't been able to uh, progress as it should. There are four complexes, uh, four buildings in this complex, or there are five? And four, well, there are five, there are actually six buildings, four of which are temples, two of which date to the 11th century, and the other two, according to the paintings, are later, but there's one of them has a door, the one that you see one, opposite, one, which um, is certainly very early, maybe the 11th century. Um, so the temple the temple is itself, later, but... No, uh, it, it's difficult to say. At the moment, for instance, it's being used as a temple for the mountain god uh, Reo Pugil. Uh, no, that's, that's, that's the one the, there. Right, that's the one that's directly opposite. I think you noticed yourself that in the early morning, the light comes in uh, directly through the door, and one sees from that door, one directly sees the Leopergule. So this is there's a constant uh, f uh, lamps burning in that temple, and uh, meditation is said to the god of that mountain. And in the large temple opposite us, there are lamps always burning and meditations and prayers being said to Buddhist gods. So they cover all their bases here. <laughs> and then in addition to these four temples, there are uh, two uh, sort of community halls. Uh, one is a... That one? one? That's th and, they're, and they're quite recent. I mean, they date sometime to this century. One is a... This big one here is a... Uh, is used as a um, gathering place and a meeting hall for the community. And uh, the other one is used as a kitchen where the uh, women's... Uh, how do they call Co it? The uh, women's cooperative, cooperative, where the women's cooperative, which is also a voluntary uh, organization in the community, uh, gathers to cook uh, food and prepare tea for whatever ceremonies are happening. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the money to to restore uh, the complex, unfortunately, in a rather disastrous fashion, because they used concrete in honor of His Holiness's visit in 1996 was uh, donated by the Himachal state government, not for the religious structure, uh, which probably may be against the state constitution in India, I don't know, but yes, they, I don't think, uh, yeah, I think they weren't, uh, they're not able to yeah. donate money for a religious structure, but they were able to donate the money because of the this large structure between the temples, which is actually the community mm -hmm. center. So, uh, so the money was donated for the community center mm -hmm. and the kitchen, not for the temples. But naturally, the clever people of Naka were able to use it for both, <laughs> <laughs> for both things. But uh, about these monasteries, I think uh, Rinchen Zangpo is responsible for 108 of them. Like, can you tell us the story about? Well, that that's a mythical number. There's always 108 of everything, mm -hmm. and there's no reason to think that he built 108. But in his biography, there are a list of the uh, four greater places, all of which are still known today. Uh, tolling Kojana, Nyarma, and I have to confess I've forgotten the other one. Christian? Would you remember? Uh, he might. <laughs> in any case, yeah. in any case, we know that we know that there were the major centers, and then there's this, what's called in the um, 
in the biography the 21 minor places. And of those 21 minor places to which Tavo belongs, uh, about 80% of them are known today and still have uh, chapels in them. So there seem, and, and they seem to be in geographic order. That is, they're in, they're, they're, there's a certain geographic logic to the list. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, there seems no doubt that that list is authentic. Um, but Naku doesn't find a mention in that. Naku is not mentioned in that. The local people have a, identify Naku with um, some some other name. Some other name. Whether or not that's correct is, I don't know. I mean, it's the the coin, the other names are, are identical actually. I mean, Tabo is Tabo, Ripa is Ripa, mm -hmm. uh, Ropa, Excuse me, not Ripa. Ropa is Ropak, Ropa. Um, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Lari is Lari. I mean, they they're known today. Pu is Pu. They're known today by the same names that they were. Lalung is also one of them. No, Lalung no, is Lalung later. Later. Uh, Lalung is about the same period as this as as Nako. So. Or maybe a little later. Maybe one generation later. So it might be that Rinchen Zangpo was not directly responsible for. It might or or it might no, not. It's, it's not, difficult. It's, not. it's difficult to say. In any case. We only have a gap of about uh, two or three generations, yeah, 50, 50, years. 50 70 years, whatever. Uh, and why do you think these monasteries survived in this? Is it because of the climate or is it uh, because of something else? Well, for one thing, um, anywhere that there's a continuous living religious tradition anywhere in the world, religious monuments tend to survive because people venerate them and care for them. So. Uh, for no, this I mean in the actual form, the paintings being uh, dating back to, say, like you were saying, the 10th oh. century, 11th century, in that yeah. sense. Like, does it have to do something with the uh, climate out here? Well, certainly, the climate is very dry, and uh, originally these buildings were extremely well built. They, Whoever built them knew exactly what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, not only the temples, but what's really amazing is that the clay sculptures in an earthquake zone survived almost a thousand years. That's really a miracle. So they, these were experienced builders and craftsmen who simply did a very good job. And then the dry climate helped. Uh, but as you see here, uh, the paintings won't survive if the building isn't in good condition. The building won't survive um, if the roof, the roof isn't is maintained. <laughs> so one thing depends on another. And, um, and all of the various elements that were responsible, builders and craftsmen, who simply did a very good job. And then the dry climate helped. Uh, but as you see here, uh, the paintings won't survive if the building isn't in good condition. The building won't survive um, if the roof, roof isn't maintained. <laughs> so one thing depends on another. And, um, and all of the various elements that were responsible for this work obviously uh, okay. were extremely good. And they and the interesting point is when you see uh, the, the economic level today, despite the uh, the cash crop that comes with the fruit trees and whatnot, is that obviously there was an, an economic infrastructure at that time which allowed one to use the best possible materials and the best possible craftsmen. As, as you've seen from this experience of trying to repair the, uh, the chapels, a small community like this of 40 houses or whatever, 50 houses, 60, 60 something like that, can't support the best masons mm -hmm. in the world. I mean, obviously, if uh, I mean they're they're not just full time masons; they're also farmers, and one of them is a llama, and or two of them. I mean, they're doing sixteen different things mm -hmm. because that's just the way way it is here. So, chances are that some of the craftsmen were also imported or itinerant, and were involved in all of these large building projects. And it, no, uh, but oh, and the other reason that they survived certainly was that Buddhism remained a living tradition. There was a monastery, a large monastery. Within living memory, it's said that there were 80 students here during the winter. During the summer, of course, people worked their fields. Mm -hmm. But um, but all of this contributes to the health of the monastery. If you have a living monastery here with an abbot who's, as you see in Tabo, I mean, the, the minute that the a slightest blemish occurs anywhere, uh, our dear Geshe, the abbot of Tavo, makes sure to it, then he has every available hand out there fixing it. The roof is cleaned mm -hmm. continuously during the winter, and no water is allowed to seep in anywhere. I mean, this is how it is if you have a functioning monastery, and that's what happened here. People just took care of it. Uh, this is the village out here, right? Mm -hmm. And those are the fields. Mm -hmm. But 
would you say like like you were saying uh, you needed a little bit of economic prosperity to be able to well uh, a lot more i mean the people today could never with all the best of their will they could never afford to build these chapels yeah, today right. so what would you say was the base for the people of a thousand years ago i mean like is there well nobody we have absolutely no historical documentation the um the political center this the the period this these temples were built at the end of the period which is known in tibetan as the chi dar the second um spreading of buddhism diffusion. or diffusion of buddhism mm -hmm. and uh, what that refers to is the importation and of, of buddhism through the translation of texts and and pandits uh, into tibet from india and uh, that whole process occurred basically from Kashmir through this area, as well as from Northeast India, from Bengal, Bihar, and Orissa, up through um, uh, Nepal into. And it was channelized through this area. But this was one and of the two. This was one. Well, there was one, two two ways it came. One way was uh, via Western Nepal and Purang directly into Western Tibet, and then from uh, Kashmir through this area into Western Tibet. So that we Tabo is, is is mentioned at least in one in ancient text, and it says there that it was a center for for uh, Tibetan Tibetans and Indians to study and learn each other's language. It's where, uh, so that it would play this role as a mediator between Tibet and India. And uh, Naka would have logically played the same role. As you've noticed here, the local language, Kenori, is essentially Tibetan. Mm -hmm. So uh, whereas originally this is probably a, a Dardic population, that is an Aryan population, they didn't, certainly never spoke any Tibetan language until the second diffusion of Buddhism, when this whole area came under the political control of a dynasty whose center is in Toling. Oh, this was a part of? Of the kingdom of Purangugi. And Gugi is, is in modern western Tibet, around what's called Ali by the Chinese, mm -hmm. uh, where Toling was the center okay. of that. So, so uh, this large empire, uh, which, which was a large and very prosperous empire, uh, had control of the international long-distance trade, which went through these areas. And of course, using the same network, the trade went on also then religious teachers traveled. I mean, this mm -hmm. using the same network. I mean, uh, for instance, uh, today you don't build roads so the children can go to school. Mm -hmm. You have uh, roads so that business can yeah. can flourish, and then the children latch themselves onto <laughs> to that system. It was the same, mm -hmm. the same then. And uh, my theory, which is not, uh, I mean, we can we can hardly corroborate it, but my theory also is that uh, part of this economic infrastructure came from gold. Gold was and still is mined in the region of Kailasha, but and in Western Tibet. Okay. And so it was under the control of the kings of Western Tibet, uh -huh. and uh, apparently uh, it was sufficient to in encourage uh, the kind of long-distance international trade that uh, resulted in the kind of surplus which allowed the creation of so many uh, monasteries, monasteries and, and temples, temples which were decorated in such a high quality. Yeah, but uh, these temples, then, they had a certain amount of uh, royal patronage. You have to let me photograph this, yeah. sorry. Yeah, Deborah? At least he's going to make it to school somehow. Yep. Um, so we were talking about how these monasteries came about and all that. So you would say there was a certain amount of royal patronage also? It's not a certain amount. There was, there was the royal patronage was the key point in the whole thing. It was the kings of Puranguge who uh, who initiated and supported the entire um, process of, of um, building the monasteries and, and what they called purifying the religion, importing teachers, and creating ceremonies, schools, translations, all of that. I mean, that's, it's practically impossible for such a huge effort to be done by local contributions. <laughs> yeah. and how, how long did this period last? I mean, like About a hundred and... Mm, from the middle of the 10th century to about 1100, beginning of the 12th century. So 
say after the 12th century? Oh, oh, the period. Well, there are two different things. One is the the period, the patronage of the kings of yeah. Puranguge. Yeah, that lasted from about the middle of the 10th until the beginning of the 12th. But the Chidar continued for another hundred years. About okay, the the, the period. The period of the second, second diffusion of Buddhism. No, but what I meant was like after the royal patronage, since the kings were no longer powerful, mm -hmm. then it was the village or the sponsoring villages. Well, you don't have that many uh, in the latter part of that period. You don't have any uh, major building efforts. You have you the the various structures that were set in place, the translation mm -hmm. projects particularly, and the study of Buddhism, great philosophical inquiries, and uh, really very high level of intellectual pursuit, as there was also in India during the contemporary period, um, except that that was a period of, of great turmoil in India because of the Muslim invasions. Um, but in any case, the, um, these things uh, flourished, but the actual building of large-scale temples and their decoration, which is an extremely expensive uh, undertaking, this uh, seemed to have come to uh, to an end yeah yeah the great period of building was under the kings of Puranguge. so then it was just preserved whatever had been built were mm -hmm. just or or renovated you oh, know no, repainted no. or whatever but tell me something uh, like you said it was a period of turmoil in uh, in the on plains with the muslim invasions and all the muslims never uh, came to this area or there was no uh, desecration of these temples the muslims came much Later, uh, I don't think actually the Muslims were in this area that I recall. The Muslims were in uh, the Mughals, the Mughals, mm -hmm. the early Mughals were in Ladakh, mm -hmm. but I don't think they came to this area. The uh, the only really violently destructive period in this area was the period of the Sikh wars. Sikh wars. The the Sikh invasions came through Spiti, I believe it was 1841. One of the uh, Sikh generals and destroyed Tabo, for that instance. Was during Ranjit Singh's time? Or? I don't know what 1841 is, but I, I remember that it's 1841. And Tabo was destroyed? You'll have to look time? look yeah. in my Tabo yeah. book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Tabo was destroyed at that time? It was, well, it wasn't Partially. destroyed, obviously, but it was heavily damaged, let us say. No, so why did the Sikhs come up? They were point? heading towards Tibet. Oh, they were heading towards Tibet. Yeah, where they, and, and, and in point of fact, at which they reached, of course. They went through western Tibet down into Purong. And uh, apparently, according to the treaties and whatnot, uh, their goal in western Tibet was was the gold fields. Gold. Yeah. But th they never could control the area, I mean. It was very briefly, uh, they, um, there were two periods when this area, n not directly Nako, because Nako is so high, of course, but generally uh, Spiti Kanor, um, there were, there were two sort of critical periods in terms of, of uh, political conflict and change, and that was in the end of the 17th century under the Ladakhi kings, when the Ladakhi kings tried to, to conquer Western Tibet, or did conquer Western Tibet, but that time and in the mid-19th century. But the Ladakhis wouldn't uh, have destroyed uh, temples or damaged them because... Well, they were also Buddhist. As far as I know, they didn't. As far as I know, they didn't. But these were very tumultuous periods. Anything can happen, yeah. But the the big thing was that that uh, in the 19th century, very shortly after Tibet actually won, but but very quickly this area uh, convert, re reverted once again to um, to local control. In in this time, in the hands of the Bushar kings, whose capitals were in Rampur and Sarahan.